So I move very quickly to our first speaker. We have Bob Jessup. Uh, is a distinguished professor of sociology at Lancaster University. He has numerous publications, including The State, Past, Present, Future, Towards a Culture, Political Economy, Putting Culture in Its Place in Econo uh, Political Economy, and State Power, a uh, Strategic Relational Approach. The title of his talk today is Marx on the Analysis of Social Formation, Implication for a Critique of Neoliberalism. Yes, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to come to York yet again to talk to an enthusiastic audience. I'm going to be straying from my original plan, which was more Marxological, and to present some of the implications of Marx's critique of political economy for understanding and critiquing neoliberalism and this comes from the old days when we had Marx reading groups we still do and one of the first things that I learned in a Marx reading group for those who read German you can already see there it's a book to study not to read so I think we should have books called studying capital and not reading capital but we should be rereading capital at least uh, I know time is very short. I should be trying to be disciplined. So I'm going to give you the summary of my presentation. And then if I'm cut off in uh, mid-course, at least you know what the takeaway messages are. So I'm going to start with the idea of Marx as a polymath. Uh, John Bellamy Foster has already emphasized some of these aspects in his work. I'm going to deal with a problem that Marx addressed again and again, the idea that beginnings in science are always difficult. And then I'm going to take seriously the start of Capital, Volume 1, where we're just told that the commodity is the elementary form of the capital relation. It's described as the cell form in the preface to the first German edition, and in the text we'll see a reference to it as a germ form. And I want to s consider why it is that this is the beginning that he eventually chose for the analysis of capital, both in the contribution to the critique of political economy and in capital itself. And I'm going to look then at what it means to undertake a form analysis. And for me, forms have to be reproduced. They don't reproduce themselves automatically. Every form is contradictory which implies structural contradictions. And for me, every structural contradiction translates into a strategic dilemma. So focusing on contradictions, focusing on form analysis, far from eliminating agency, brings agency in very, very firmly because a structural contradiction translates into a strategic dilemma which requires decisions about how one goes on in the face of that contradiction. And they're going to pull out the implications of that for neoliberalism and its crises. And then, if there's time, I'll address a couple of other issues. But if I can get to the part on neoliberalism, I shall be happy, and hopefully you'll be content. So Marx errs a polymath. We all know from Engel's speech at the graveside of Marx, from Lenin on the three sources and component parts of Marxism, there were three sources of Marxism, German philosophy, English political economy, French socialism. One could have a great deal more. That, I think, was just a simplification. But Engels, in the comments on Ludwig Feuerbach and the end of German philosophy, says that Feuerbach lived to see three decisive discoveries in 19th century science, the transformation of energy, the theory of evolution named after Darwin, and the discovery of the cell. And of course, if Feuerbach lived to see that, then Marx did as well. And we can actually see a relationship between those three discoveries and Marx's work. Uh, Anson Rabinbach, Amy Wendling, and others have pointed out that it was only with the discovery of thermodynamics, and then dynamics, particularly as applied to machines, 
that led to Marx's being able to distinguish between labor and labor power. And that is a key contribution, of course, to Marx's work. We know that Marx and Engels were very interested in Darwin and saw themselves as doing in the, in the human sciences what Darwin was doing in the natural sciences. And the third decisive discovery, the discovery of the cell, the commodity is the cell form, the elementary form, the germ, the germ form, etc., of capital. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to cell biology in the 19th century, which was a particularly German tradition. Cell theory, at the time that Marx was writing, I'm not talking about today, at the time that Marx was writing, cell theory is the idea that all living organisms are comprised of cells, and all cells arise from other cells. Biologists, especially in Germany, posited these ideas in the mid-1800s. We already find, before Marx wrote to Capital, began to draft it, the idea of the stem cell circulating in German biology. But it wasn't established scientifically until the 1890s. But the idea was there. Not only was it there, but it was there in regard to people with whom Marx interacted. The German work, the German work was translated into English. Other German work on cell biology was translated by E. Ray Lancaster. Many of you will know he was the natural scientist with whom Marx interacted very extensively. Of course, Engels wrote on it as well. So I think that we could see the final starting point as a reflection of Marx's engagement with cell biology. And in deference to Bertel, I think this belongs actually to the logic of discovery and self-clarification. It plays a relatively minor role in the order of presentation, and I'll discuss why that might be the case. So, the reading room, beginnings in science are always difficult, and the motto of this conference is the bourgeoisie will live to uh, despair about the carbuncles on my backside. But um, what, what, what was the problem of finding the beginnings for Marx's critique of capital, or critique of the capitalist mode? We have a succession of starting points. The separation between state and civil society, Money is a central component of civil society in the manuscripts. Social relations of reproduction, German ideology. Money as a social relation, poverty of philosophy. The reconceptualization of civil society is the starting point in the 1857 introduction. Money, exchange relations, and then capital in the Grundrisse. And then in the contribution to the critique of political economy as well as in capital, commodity as cell form. So the wealth of those societies in which the CMP reigns takes the form of a genetic collection of commodities. That's from the first German edition, the translation of the first German edition. The commodity is the elementary form of the commodity, capitalist mode of production. A commodity is a contradictory unity of use and exchange value. Perhaps we should say the value form of the commodity is a contradictory unity of use and exchange value. Marx goes on then to discuss two special commodities, labor, power, and money. He might eventually have gone on to discuss land as a special type of commodity. And we know from the Grundrisse there were interesting discussions on knowledge as a special kind of commodity. Karl Polanyi would, of course, have called them fictitious commodities, as I do too. Wage labor is the historically specific key to deciphering the CMP, capitals of social relation, diverse laws of accumulation. So just to reinforce the point, the opening lines of the contribution to the critique, repeated even though Marx recognized the contribution to the critique of political economy was a disaster. Darwin came out in 1859. It was out of print within a couple of weeks. I expect they remained a the contribution to the critique of political economy, although Mikko will tell me. Uh, the opening lines of capital exactly the same. And as Moish Postone has pointed out, the point about making the starting point, the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails, is an immense accumulation of quality. Absolutely crucial distinction 
of trying to get at the historical specificity of the dynamic of capital accumulation. Now, if Marx were alive in 20 years after 1867, which he was, and Red was continuing to read biology, he would have come across the idea of the economic cell form or stem cell form. Some people, Richard Marsden, and in fact, in conversation today, Moish Stone had said, no, he would be talking about DNA. That's too late, but the stem cell form and stem cell form are interesting. What's interesting about a stem cell, it's a pluripotent cell that can replicate itself or can differentiate into many cell types. What's the commodity form? Commodity, money, commodity. Through circulation, it can replicate itself. Through money, commodity, money, prime, it can replicate itself, but now not as simple circulation, but as capitalist circulation. And it can differentiate itself into many variants of the commodity form. And Marx is quite explicit, for example, in relation to the price form. He talks about a series of steps of metamorph metamorphosis necessary to get at the price form. And my view on form analysis is Marx isn't just interested in the commodity form, the wage form, the price form. He's interested in the study of the social formation. And the social formation is a coherent ensemble of social forms that if they're not isomorphic, and I don't think they will be, are at least complementary and so forth. So this is why I think the cell form has potential as the beginning of capital. What are the risks? Because Marx actually doesn't belabor this. Uh, one risk, it's very interesting, in 1857, Rudolf Virchow, a pathologist and German liberal, who was sympathetic to the German workers' movement, and Marx was quite keen on him, considered him supportive, wrote, omnis cellula et cellula, every cell arises from another cell. Ludwig Kugelmann, who knew him well, uh, tried to use the publication of Capital in 1867 to convert Virchow to scientific socialism away from liberalism and sent a copy of Marx's Capital to Virchow and said, P.S., in making him aware of, wrote writing to Marx, P.S., in making him aware of your work, I told him how you regard commodities as cells, how you analyze bourgeois society, etc. You follow the same method in political economy as he does in medicine, that your capital could therefore be dubbed the social pathology of bourgeois society. Of course, Marx thought it was the anatomy of civil society, not the social pathology of bourgeois society. And there's already a, a, a difficulty. You can see you could belabor and overdo this metaphor, and it would distract you from the real scientific value of capital. But the metaphor can also be overdone. We've already got pathology. At this time also, the failure of reproduction of cells was being related to cancer and so forth. This is also a dangerous metaphor if you were going down that road. There are also limits to the analogy that cells reproduce themselves through internal mechanisms, through proteomic protein triggering and energy inputs. But the economic cell form and all other forms of the capital relation are reproduced in and through struggle. They don't reproduce themselves automatically. Even if we think of das automatische Subjekt, it actually is more a way of thinking about the primacy of the overall logics of the circuit. And of course, they also constrain. And there are political dangers. The scientific materialists, and you'll recognize some of these names, like Karl Vogt, and others were taking biology and Darwinism too literally and for non-revolutionary ends. So there was a danger that if one pushed this metaphor too far, you might end up in the wrong political camp. Nonetheless, we can see this metaphor running through. Uh, for example, in the Grundrisse, um, Marx argues that circulation doesn't carry within itself the principle of self-renewal. The moments of self-renewal are presupposed by circulation CMC, not posited by it, hence turn to the study of production. Contrary, this is still the Grundrisse, contrary to the circuits of commercial capital, industrial capital, profit-producing capital, bears the principle of its own renewal and growth. Hence, the production process of capital can be considered as a living organism. And if you remember the introduction to, sorry, the preface, 
for the first German edition, Marx says, in the sciences, they have experiments. In the, natural, in the social sciences, we have thought experiments. We have to substitute the thought experiment for the use of the microscope as in anatomy, biology, and in those days, how you studied cells was through the microscope. So I think there's a very interesting analogy here. There is something that lies at the bottom of this circulation, therefore, which appears as immediately present on the surface of bourgeois society, exists only insofar as it's constantly mediating. And I think the form analysis, beginning with the commodity, is how one explores those mediations, always bearing in mind that forms reproduce themselves through agency. So the self-valorization of capital. Only when the commodity form is generalized to labor power, a fictitious commodity, does the market-mediated self-valoration of capital become possible. In that case, then, the cell reproduces itself through the cell or the cell forms. Only then does the appropriation of surplus labor gain its distinctive mediation through market forces. And I'll skip that. But as soon as Marx has introduced the idea of the commodity, he moves on. There are two sides of the commodity, qualitative use value, exchange value. And he develops that idea before going on again to talk about the two special commodities. Labor power, it has a price, but it's not yet produced within a competitive capitalist labor process for sale. In my own teaching, I then throw up brave new world and babies being reproduced within capitalist conditions of production to minimize the socially necessary labor time involved in reproducing labor power as a commodity. We all know that doesn't happen. We all know the family is important and so forth. And money, the universal commodity. Marx starts out with gold or silver bullion, but we know that it's a special kind of commodity because it's also a symbolic medium. In the Grunner, Sir Marx already points out that if they relied on gold, capital accumulation wouldn't go very far. You have to move to credit. We've heard something about that already. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to send this PowerPoint round. I've written this up already. But what I want to argue is that every form of the capital relation can be seen or interpreted analogously with the contradiction in the commodity form. Just to take two examples, these are the ones I use with my own students, is the wage of cost of production or a source of demand answer both. Um, is money an international currency or national money legal tender? Uh, one could go on, is land a free gift of nature that's currently unalienable, or is it um, something that can be alienated and so forth is knowledge, intellectual property or intellectual commons. Um, and what's the significance of these contradictions? And Marx analyzes them in detail. It would be a very interesting philological exercise to go through and see how Marx treats all of the forms in terms of contradictions. It's these contradictions on the one hand are incompressible, but they vary in importance in different stages and varieties of capitalism. In Keynesian welfare state, you prioritize the wage as a source of demand and money as national money. The crisis of Fordism is when the money increasingly is international currency and the wage is increasingly seen, including the social wage, as a cost of international production. Neoliberalism, and this is going to be the point of my argument, actually has a very different approach to the different moments of these contradictions. And so how you handle contradictions in terms of addressing them as strategic dilemmas leads to the analysis of varieties of capitalism, different stages of capitalism, and so forth. Now, we know that Marx said that capitalism, the very nature of the circulation of capital, the circuits of production, generates the abstract possibility of crisis, because the circuits can break at different points. Uh, we also know, he said, the abstract possibility of crisis is no explanation of the actual dynamics of specific crises. So we can move away from this graffito, capitalism is crisis, and turn it into, is the abstract possibility of crisis, and specific crisis tendencies, and their realization. This is a bit like Monty Python, and the, uh, you, you can't even spell tendencies boy. Uh, so we'll, we'll gloss over that and uh, move on quickly 
uh, to why neoliberalism matters. Why does neoliberalism matter? Because it privileges one-sidedly the exchange value moment, not only of the wage, not only of money, not only of capital, either as a stock of specific assets to be valorized in a particular time and place, or as a sum of money, capital in general, available for investment anywhere around the world. Regardless of type, and that presupposes the typology of neoliberalisms that I haven't given you, neoliberalism generalizes and intensifies contradictions on a world scale. World crises become possible. The logic of capital colonizes other systems and the life world. It also destabilizes the spatio-temporal fixes that enabled some zones of relative to stability in the world economy to survive by deferring or displacing their contradiction, deferring into the future, displacing elsewhere. It creates zones of insecurity and stability, as well as zones of prosperity and stability. It defers basic problems into the future. Eventually, it needs flanking and supporting mechanisms, such as the third way, just to keep the show on the road. This is a lovely quotation from John Craig Roberts on the irrationalities of neoliberalism, talking about the United States, but it may ring bells in the United Kingdom, possibly Canada, and so forth. We now in a, live in a nation where, because of this one-sided prioritization of exchange value, he doesn't put it like that, doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and our banks destroy the economy. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All those laws developed in classical works on political economy are strictly true only on the assumption that trade is free from all fetters, competition be perfectly free, not only in a single country but on the whole earth. Those laws which Smith, Say, and Ricardo developed, the laws under which wealth is produced and distributed, grow more true, more exact, less abstract, to the extent that free trade occurs. Thus the economists, Ricardo and others, know more about society as it will be than society as it is. They know more about the future than about the present. You know where I'm going, which is that Marx also knew more about the future than he did about the present. And that's because the world market was still underdeveloped uh, where he was alive. I'm going to skip over that. This is an important quotation. The movement of capital, though much accelerated, still remained, however, relatively slow. The splitting up of the world market into separate parts, each of which was exploited by a particular nation. The exclusion of competition among themselves on the part of nations, the clumsiness of production itself, and the fact that finance was only evolving from its early stages greatly impeded circulation. What neoliberalism does is to overcome those barriers to the completion of the world market. And I see neoliberalism as a project of the completion of the world market with all the frictions, obstacles, resistances, and so forth that stand in its way. And let me just go to the conclusions, because I said I would be very disciplined. We grammar school boys from England are always very disciplined. <laughs> and so what Marx was arguing was, and this is uh, partly this refers to slides I haven't presented, where do we start with the critique of the capitalist mode of production? Beginnings in science are always difficult. I think there is a logic to settling on the cell form. More to do with the logic of discovery and self-clarification than integrating it in a very explicit, in-your-face way in capital, for some of the reasons that I pointed out. I think, nonetheless, by taking the idea of the cell form as, A, something that repeats and replicates itself, which gives you the circuits of capital and so forth, but also something which is pluripotential and that helps you to understand the coherence, the compatibility among all the other forms of the capital relation, we can begin to understand something about the contradictory, dilemmatic nature and the role of agency. And I think the originality of his analysis is how the generalization of the commodity form of labor power explains capital's unique historical dynamic and dynamism, 
And as Moish Postone points out in his book, it's a direction on dynamic, but no telos. And it's the forms of the capital relation and their indeterminacy that creates that directional dynamic without uh, a telos. And I'm going to stop there.